There's something like 25 million citations in PubMed, um, and that number is growing exponentially. My name is Elizabeth Allen. Um, I have been here at OHSU in the VA in Portland since 1991 when I came here to do my residency. Hi, I'm uh, Vinay Prasad. I'm an assistant professor of medicine here at OHSU. Uh, I'm a hematologist oncologist. Um, my name is Adam Obley. I'm an assistant professor of medicine um, at OHSU and I do my clinical work as a general internist primarily as a hospitalist on the teaching service at the Portland VA. Um, I think some of the resources that I use on a regular basis, I tend to scan the Cochrane Library, I use ACP Journal Club, um, and a variety of other sort of summary resources. Uh, evidence updates put out by um, McMaster. I have them come to my email once a week. I scan the titles of the relevant articles that they flagged as um, being important for either a general internist or a hospitalist. So I would say each week you should pick a set of journals you want to keep tabs on. And then what I would say is just skim the table of contents every day it comes out. And you don't have to read everything, but if something catches your eye, uh, that's the kind of article you should uh, take a closer look at. I'm very, I try to be very conscientious about identifying clinical questions, writing them down either on the board or in my little notebook, um, and then trying to look up at least half of them. So when I read a paper, I usually scan the abstract first, just to get a sense for what question was being asked um, and the type of study design that was used to answer the question. I start out by reading the background statement to see if this article is something I'm remotely interested in and whether it's relevant to my practice. I learn quickly here in the methods that it's a study involving secondary prevention. These are patients who already have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, so that's going to lump how I think about this study and how, where, how I apply it. It's not going to be relevant for primary prevention. I also learn in the methods that this, is monoc this monoclonal antibody therapy is added to conventional therapy, statin therapy, which um, also relates to how I'm going to apply this in the future. So after reading the methods quickly, I then look at the funding source. The funding source is Amgen. Mm. It's a pharmaceutical company funding this study. You do need to be a little more careful when you have a drug company funding the study to make sure there are not sources of bias that are not quite as obvious. Um, the next thing I'd like to see is the authors and what their conflicts of interest are. The next thing I would do is go to the last sentence in the introduction. I skip the whole introduction, but what I do like to see is the PICO statement. This is where the authors usually pose the, the kind of the PICO question this trial is trying to address. Reforming the PICO. In patients with clinically evident atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, i.e. secondary prevention patients, does the use of a monoclonal antibody, I'll call it that so I don't have to keep stumbling over the name, added to higher moderate intensity statin therapy um, result in improved cardiovascular outcomes when compared to um, solo therapy with high or moderate intensity statin therapy. And right off the bat, I'm a little confused as to why we allowed moderate intensity statin therapy patients to be included because these are secondary prevention. Um, this is a secondary prevention trial, and the guidelines indicate that these patients should be on high-intensity therapy. The first thing that you should read in any paper, in my opinion, is the methods. Um, and the reason you do that is to establish the internal validity of a trial. Um, if there's uh, such a high risk of bias based on the study design and execution um, that you have reason to doubt that the results are valid, then there's really no reason to go on. Again, it reiterates double-blinded, placebo control, randomized, multinational clinical trials in patients from over 1,200 sites in 49 countries. Wow. Okay. Structurally, this sounds like an ideal 
trial. I will be able to apply it broadly because it's from patients all over the world. It's randomized, which we all know is the first validity criteria. And it tells us that the trial sponsor collaborated in designing the trial. Ooh, that's a little concerning. Usually you like them to be the funder, but not involved in the design, the e execution of this trial, but there it is. It's been pretty well established now based on some Cochrane work. The Cochrane Methods Group has looked at um, the uh, effects of industry involvement on tr uh, studies um, with some pretty convincing um, results showing that industry sponsorship, quite separate from the risk of bias and the, uh, the conventional ways of assessing risk of bias in a trial, um, influences the outcomes in ways that are more positive when it's industry sponsored. So we're looking at adult patients 40 to 85. It's nice that they go that old because a lot of these studies don't. Clinically evident cardiovascular disease, that's nice to know. Okay, so I know adult patients, secondary prevention, all on statins, at least a torvastatin 20. That is reassuring. So we'll look first for uh, appropriate allocation concealment and random sequence generation. Um, and sure enough, we find that uh, patients were assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, Randomization was performed in a double-blinded manner with the use of a central computerized system with stratification according to the final screening LDL um, and region, which in this case means that as we look through our um, table one of patient characteristics, we should generally find that the LDL cholesterol levels at baseline were similar, um, and additionally that they should be evenly distributed across regions. And whenever there's a composite, you want to look at each component to make sure they're equally relevant and of equal severity. Cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, or coronary revascularization. Of those items, most would be considered equally bad, except for hospitalization for unstable angina. That's kind of a loose outcome, and I wish that hadn't been included. There are some things in here that are profoundly important. Uh, but there are some things in here that are less important. So revascularization is a notoriously less important endpoint. Um, it's also heavily influenced by unblinding or unmasking. Uh, I'm sorry, unblinding. Uh, stroke, yeah, it can be something that's devastating, but it can also be sort of, you know, nonspecific MRI changes with minimal symptoms. Same thing with MRI, it exists, with MI, it exists on a spectrum. And they very nicely detail the, statistic, the setup of the study um, and how they decided how many patients to recruit, the power of this study, which is 90%, the size difference in treatment effect they were um, uh, able to, they were powered to see. The next question then would be, was there any, uh, was there a significant rate of attrition in the trial? Um, and we should be able to find that here in the, uh, at the outset of the results. Um, and indeed, what we find is that um, follow-up was largely complete, um, but we should note that there was a 12.5% discontinuation rate across the trial. Um, reassuringly, that was symmetric across both the, the placebo and the, the treatment and the experimental groups. And I want a consort diagram, a diagram that shows me how patients flowed through this trial. The patient characteristics, uh, they actually stack up quite well. Um, I had mentioned that because of the stratified randomization, we should expect that um, the mean lipid level should be equivalent in both groups, and we find that that is indeed the case here by the median lipid measures. I don't care if they give p-values or not. I'm just looking to see are the patients in the treatment group, i.e. the monoclonal antibody plus a high or medium intensity statin or placebo. These are, I try and characterize my patients, these are 62-year-old white men who are European in large part. A few have had strokes and other things, but mostly they're getting in this study because they've had MIs. Looking at the other characteristics, they seem to be largely evenly distributed. The only one that jumped out at me is potentially different um, was the higher rate of peripheral arterial disease um, in the evolocumab group um, compared to the placebo group. When you see something like that, the next question to ask is in what direction would that bias accrue? Well, 30% of the people were on Modern intensity statin, that would be a Torva 20. Interesting. That's quite a sizable proportion of patients who should be on high intensity statin that aren't. It's clear that those patients receiving the treatment intervention had substantially lower LDL levels than patients in the medium or high intensity statin group. I will say that by the mere fact that this lowers LDL so much, 
um, this trial is effectively unblind. Provider will know that a patient got Evolocum adverse placebo because when the provider checks the LDL level, it'll be 30 rather than 90. And that there appears to be a small difference between the treatment group and the placebo group. What is that? 6.9, uh, 1.5 percentage difference. Same goes for up here in the primary endpoint. We know that a number needed to treat is 1 divided by the absolute risk reduction, which is 1.5%, so 1 divided by 0.015, which if you're good, you can do in your head, or if you're bad like me, you do on a calculator, and comes out to like 67. So I would need to treat 67 people with this fancy new monoclonal antibody on top of their statin to have one less cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. I don't really care about the composite primary endpoint. I care about the components. I want to look for the most important, which is cardiovascular death. Cardiovascular death was unchanged. Okay. What about death from any cause? The real most important endpoint, unchanged. Stroke. A very modest reduction in stroke, about half a percentage point. Revascularization. This is where, this is what's doing the heavy lifting, it looks like. One and a half percent significant. Go and look at the secondary. They had to blow it up because the difference is really pretty tiny. <laughs> but there is a difference, and it is statistically significant, between the treatment arm and the placebo arm. And we see that there's really not big difference in adverse events between treatment and control. To be honest, that's basically it. I rarely read the conclusions or the discussion because it just may bias me. The takeaway points here. Uh, this is probably a, a well-done, internally valid trial um, that I would uh, accept the results. I think the, the question really is, is the magnitude of the benefit um, and starting to get to sort of the external validity of the trial. One trick that I would um, apply here, which is a, sort of a very crude um, means of cost-effectiveness um, analysis, is what's called the cost of preventing one event. Um, and if you crunch the numbers here, the, uh, using sort of a yearly cost of um, one of these drugs of about $15,000, um, and knowing that the number needed to treat, depending on which of those outcomes we're looking at, is somewhere between 75 and 200 people to prevent one event, um, then the cost, um, looking at the, just the cost of preventing one event, um, is pretty high. It's for revascularization. To prevent one revascularization, the cost is about 3.3 million. Um, or the cost of preventing uh, one ischemic stroke is about 9 million. There's a 1.2 percentage point absolute difference in the raised of MI. One potential explanation is that the MIs that were averted were not STA elevation MIs, but rather troponin elevations of unclear significance. These MIs of lesser severity could be related to the fact that more patients underwent revascularization. So you see what happens is because the LDL is clearly lower, this trial is unblinded. If you unblind a cardiologist from someone's treatment, and if you tell the cardiologist this patient has very low LDL, perhaps on the margin that cardiologist is less likely to take that patient to cath if that patient complained of the same symptoms with the higher LDL. Because cardiologists are people too, and they believe in the power of lipid-modifying agents to, over time, reduce atherosclerotic burden. So if they know that the LDL is 30, they might say, let's give it a little more time, let's see how this does. But if they know the LDL is 90, and by the way, 90 is a bit high. With high-dose statin therapy, you could drop that a little bit lower to 70. So that also tells me the control arm, they didn't really push the dose of the statin. So, you know, that's a little bit, you know, suboptimal. So if the cardiologist knows these patients are on the drug and less likely to take them to cath lab, they're less likely to get that post-cath lab um, uh, non-ST elevation MI. And that perhaps could be driving some of this outcome. So that's usually how I read these papers. I, I don't read too much of their discussion and in intro. Um, I, I cut to the results and then the methods. I, if I identify an article that might be of interest to me, I start by reading the, um, the methods portion of the abstract, just to see if the trial is of a quality sufficient that it bears, um, it's worthwhile spending time reading it. Um, uh, if I like the methods section of the abstract, I go on to read um, the first sentence of the intro paragraph to get the PICO question that the article is trying to answer. I then read the entire methods section. That is the one place I don't skimp because that is where you can figure out whether your article is biased or not. 
After the methods, I just look at the pictures. I do not read the results section um, uh, unless I'm confused or something seems to be sorely lacking in the diagrams and tables. Um, I particularly like to see a flow diagram um, to identify how patients flow through the trial, how many patients who are lost to follow-up, um, how many um, completed follow-up, any well done randomized controlled trials should include that flow diagram. I look closely at table one to figure out who the patients are in the trial and whether um, important characteristics are distributed easily, evenly between randomization groups. Um, and then the results. And if they don't provide me things like numbers needed to treat, I calculate them. Okay, so the, the first thing I jump to is the results. I take a look at the results. One was the benefit. Uh, an improvement in a clinically relevant endpoint of a sufficient magnitude to pique my interest. Uh, if it's an improvement in a surrogate endpoint or a clinical endpoint, but it's of such small magnitude, it's a triviality, I usually stop right there, I, I go no further. But if it looks like it's a, a big benefit in a clinical endpoint, something that might change my practice, that's when I dive into the methods. Uh, I take a close look at what was the comparator of this study, was it a fair comparison, um, if there were any sort of imbalances in the trial that could skew the results, um, different design elements that are notorious for bias. Uh, so I kind of tease through the methods only if the benefit is something that um, piques my interest. I, as I said, I start with the methods to determine whether or not the trial has uh, sufficient internal validity that I should go on and read the results and, and believe the results. Um, in this case, um, I use sort of a standard Cochrane risk of bias assessment tool, um, which would follow sort of everything that we teach in the residency program here about the, um, assessing the risk of bias in various domains um, for a randomized controlled trial. Um, beyond that, I think the next question, once you've established the, that there's sufficient internal validity for a trial, um, is to look at the results. And probably one of the most important questions there is to establish the, the magnitude of the results. Um, in many cases, you can have statistically significant benefits that may not truly be important, either because the outcome itself um, isn't particularly meaningful or um, because the magnitude of the benefit is small and the absolute risk reduction or the absolute benefit for patients can be small. And I think that was um, certainly the case in, in the trial that we looked at.